today uh, to worship with us as we start a new series. Uh, just a bit of advertisement, if you haven't got your I Love the Vine shirt yet, we still have a bunch of those uh, on sale. They're $10 each. We have Kids Small to 3X, so if you haven't gotten one of those, just see me after church. We have a, a ton of them in the back uh, if you want to get that. Uh, I just have to tell you that this series uh, started... Uh, way last summer when we were in Honduras. And so if you ever hear a preacher tell you that something has sort of germinated in his soul or he has thought about it for a long time before he ever brings it to the people, uh, this is one of those times. Uh, when we were in Honduras, we were um, I, I was doing the morning devotions and Matt was leading in, in, in worship uh, when we would get together. And... Um, so one morning I asked the question, what has changed from the days of Scripture to today? What is it that has changed from the days of the Scriptures, the days that the Scriptures were written, to today? And uh, I believe I, I found a verse that may give us a little hint to that uh, in Judges. Judges 21 says this, and this is... Uh, for all of you who've recently gotten married, you may be, you, you'll be interested in this passage that you'll be glad we didn't do it this way. Uh, it says, then they, taught, then they thought of the annual festival of the Lord held in Shiloh, south of Lebanon and north of Bethel, along the east side of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem. Now, first of all, you're glad you weren't raised in a town called Shechem. Um, but anyway, then here's, here's, here's the cool part. They told the men of Benjamin, which was a tribe, who still needed wives, go and hide in the vineyards. And when you see the young women of Shiloh come out for their dances, rush out from the vineyards, and each of you can take one of them home to the land of Benjamin to be your wife. Aren't you glad we don't still do it that way? And when their fathers and brothers come to us in protest, we will tell them, get this, please be sympathetic. Let them have your daughters, for we didn't find wives for all of them when we destroyed Jabesh Gildal, Gil Gilead. And you are not guilty of breaking the vow since you did not actually give your daughters to them in marriage. So the men of Benjamin, get this, they did as they were told, and each man caught one woman as she danced in the celebration and carried her off to be his wife. They returned to their own land and they rebuilt their towns and they lived in them. And then the people of Israel departed by tribes and families and they returned to their own homes. And, and here's, the, here's the key part. In those, in, in those days, Israel had no king. And get this, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So what has changed from the days of Scripture to the days of today? Well, what is it that's different? I begin to think, and when I was sharing the devotion, I sort of said, I begin to think that maybe sin has changed. Maybe sin has changed. And, and maybe because sin has changed from the days of Scripture to today is why we see a lot of people that are confused. And then I realize sin hasn't changed. If anything, to be honest with you, sin has got a little more civilized from the days of Scripture because if you were in the days of Noah or the days of David or Paul, um, you know, it was sort of survival of the fittest. The biggest one wins and, and tribes and countries and, and cities would come against each other and, and they would just slaughter people. And leave them in the street. And so, so we have become a little more civilized, but, but sin hasn't really changed. There was, there was murder in the scriptures. There's murder today. There was rape in the scriptures. There's rape today. There was, uh, prostitution in the scriptures. There's prostitution today. All the sins that you could think of were there in the scriptures and are still here today. So I really don't think sin has changed. And then, so I went next step. Maybe God has changed. Maybe God has changed from the days of Scripture to today. Maybe the God that I'm serving today isn't the same God of the Scriptures when I read about it. And then I begin to think, no, the Scriptures tell us that God is the same to yesterday, today, and forever. 
And so God hasn't changed. So if sin hasn't changed, and God hasn't changed, I begin to think, well, maybe, maybe the sinners themselves have changed. Maybe the people themselves have changed. And, and it really hasn't. I mean, ever since Adam and Eve, we've all been born with a sin nature. Uh, that gives us a slant, a bias, if you will, towards sin. Uh, without the presence of Christ in our life, all of us are doomed to follow after sin. Which sin may be different for you and may for me, but without Christ and the power of Christ in our life, all sinners are, are, are slanted, are born with this nature that leads them to sin. So I don't think sinners have changed. So if sin hasn't changed and God hasn't changed and the sinners haven't changed, I came to the conclusion that the thing that has changed from the days of Scripture to today are the believers. Maybe you agree with me, maybe you disagree with me. But I believe one of the things that have changed from the days of Scripture to 2014 is not the sinner, but the saint. It's not the non-believer, but the believer. It's not the lost, but it's the found. I'm going to try to prove that to you in this series. That's why we are doing this series. So those of us that are believers can maybe take a look at ourselves. And maybe we need to look at what we're doing, what we're saying, where we're going, how we're serving. And we look at ourselves throughout this series. Let me see if I can begin to prove this to you today. I want you to take a little quiz. If you have a bulletin, uh, there's, there's some blanks. Uh, you may want to try to fill those out, but they'll, they'll pop up here on the screen behind me. Three questions I want to give you as a quiz. What percentage of Americans do you believe say they believe in God? What percentage of Americans believe in God? What percentage believe in the resurrection? You know, just a couple weeks ago, we had this big service and this big celebration. What percentage of Americans do you think believe in the resurrection? And what percentage do you believe that, what percentage of Americans do you believe say Jesus is the Son of God? Just, just put in there what you think it might be. And I'm going to give you the, the true answers, the up-to-date answers. But just put in there what you think it might be and we'll see how we flesh it out. Well, the poll that I'm looking at is a November 2013. So you can't get much more uh, recent than that. November 2013. Um, it's a Harris poll, which is a very reliable poll. And here are some of the answers. And let me give them to you. 74% of Americans say they believe in God. 74%. Now, first of all, did anybody get 74? I mean, you put 74. Joey, you did? No, yeah, I didn't think so. All right, how many of you put more than 74? Okay, and how many of you put below 74? Okay, that's about split. So 74% of Americans say they believe in God. Now, you've got to listen to all of these percentages as we go down through this. 74% believe in God, but only 72% believe in miracles. Only 72% believe in miracles. 74% believe in God, but only 68% believe in heaven. Now, I don't know why if you're going to believe in God, you don't want to believe in heaven. Um, but but 74% say, I believe in God, but only 68% say, I believe in heaven. 68% say they believe Jesus is the Son of God. How many of you had 68% in your category? None of you. How many of you had more than 68% that Jesus is the Son of God? None of you. And how many had below that? Many of you. 68% say they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 65% believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 65% believe in the resurrection. 57% believe in the virgin birth. Now, of the Christian faith, that is a pillar uh, that is one of the pillars that our faith is built on simply because it's through that virgin birth that Christ was able to remain perfect. 
but 57% believe in the virgin birth. Now here's one. 19% of Americans describe themselves as very religious. And an additional 40% describe themselves as somewhat religious. So that's 59% of Americans describe themselves as religious. So 74% believe in God, 72% believe in miracles, 68% believe in heaven, 68% believe Jesus is the Son of God, 65% believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 57% believe in the virgin birth, and 59% of people categorize themselves as religious. So I guess we are still a Christian nation. I mean, if you listen to the percentages, the majority is all on our side, and those numbers don't sound so bad until I tell you that every single one of those percentages is decreasing. 74% believe in God. The last poll had 80%. 72% believe in miracles. I believe it was 76%. 68 believe in heaven. It was 72 Every single one of those percentages. So when you hear it, as a believer, you say, okay, we're still in the majority. We still have the biggest group. and all that. But what we need to realize is all of those numbers are decreasing. We are becoming every day less and less of a Christian nation. Nearly one-fourth of Americans, 23%, identify themselves as not, at, not religious at all. You say, all right, well, 23%, that's not bad. Here's what you have to know. That percentage has doubled since the last poll. So it used to be 12%, and now it's up to 23%. So, so if you look at the numbers, and I, and I like looking at numbers, you see that the good numbers are sliding negative, and the bad numbers are sliding up. So what has changed since the days of Scripture to 2014? I believe it is the believers. But this, is, this should be no surprise to us. Listen to what Paul told Timothy. Here's what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when He appears to set up His kingdom. He said, preach the Word of God. Be prepared, I love this phrase, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. So this is no surprise today that the percentages are slipping to the negative. And some of you, let me just put this in context, some of you who are just having children, you know, your baby's real small, your baby's real young, you have to realize that these numbers are sliding as your children are growing. And the world that your children are going to grow up in is going to be less Christian and less after God than even today's society is. I have a 17-year-old and about to have a 16-year-old. And it's a different world today than the day they were born. And so those of you who are parents in here, some of this should alarm you and some of this should get you set on fire of making sure you're going to do what you can with your children as you raise them. There's a phrase I want us to try to memorize as we go through this series. It's, it's a really simple phrase and here it is. The truth from the truth is the truth I will live by. The truth from the truth is the truth I will live by. The truth refers to the, the precepts and the principles and, and the guidelines and the teachings of Christ. That's the truth. 
So that truth from the truth, because in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, and He says, I am the truth. So the principles and precepts and guidelines and teachings of Christ that come from Christ will be the truth that we will live by. This week, just try to rattle that through your brain several times a day. The truth from the truth is the truth I will live by. The truth from the truth is the truth I will live by. As we start this series, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do every week. We're going to do three things. One, we're going to examine what's trending. I'm going to bring to you statistics and numbers and and proof of what I'm trying to tell you to be true in our society. We're going to look at several several different topics. They won't all be popular topics. There'll probably be a week or two that you may leave a little ticked at the preacher because he talked about something that got into your kitchen. He talked about something that got on your toes. But I'm going to bring to you what's trending. And then I'm, we're going to look at the truth from the truth. We're going to go into the Scripture. We're going to look at the truth from the truth. And then we're going to ask this very important question each week. What is our response to the truth? What is our response to the truth? The title of today's message is Coexist. Coexist. I know you've seen this uh, image or this bumper sticker up here. Uh, in fact, there's a uh, there's a car in Perry, uh, and, and the whole thing it's like a I don't know an '84 four door gray. It's, I mean, as I describe it, you're going, yeah, I've seen that car. It's just the whole thing is nothing but bumper stickers. But huh? Oh, thanks for the update. That's what's trending. <laughs> But, but, but you've seen this bumper sticker and you've seen this image and, and, and that bumper sticker and that image seems sort of simplistic enough and you say, well, can't we all just coexist? And you have to understand that that bumper sticker is not asking us to coexist. What that bumper sticker is really putting out there is that all religions are equal. All religions are are okay. All religions will eventually get you to heaven. What that bumper sticker is not saying is, can we coexist? I mean, certainly, you work with people that have different faiths and different religions. Our children go to school with children, and if you look at their class, there was a a picture of Mr. Peavy's class on Facebook this week, and if you look at his class, it's a very diverse class. And so certainly our children go to school with people who have other faiths and other beliefs and other standards. So it isn't asking, can we just coexist in this world? What that bumper sticker and what that image is really putting forward is to say that, hey, they're all equal. They're all equal. They're all the same. And they say that they all will get you to heaven. So the question this morning is, can we all coexist? Will all religions get you to heaven? Will all religions, are they all equal? Are they all the same in the end? I want to give you some terminology here to think about. Three different words we hear when we talk about religions. One is cult. One is religion. And one is denomination. Cult. Religion, denomination. Let me give you some just basic definitions of these. Here, here, a cult revolves around a person who has, by his own self-proclamation, been enlightened by a deity, and and he may even proclaim himself to be a deity. Usually, their beliefs have strayed from beyond normal society. And they're obviously, a lot of times, their activities border on violence, rebellion, sex, or even death. So that's sort of the definition of a cult, is is this person who who says that I have been enlightened by God, or may even say, I am a God, or they may even say, I am David, or I am someone who comes from the Scriptures. A religion revolves around a deity. A deity. Now this deity may be God or some other deity or exalted person believed to have supernatural power and be the key to eternity. 
If you go into almost any Chinese restaurant this afternoon, somewhere in that Chinese restaurant you will find a Buddha. You will find a, a statue, and it may be a, a big statue, and maybe something small over in the corner. If you go get your fingernails done or your toenails done, you may find a Buddha somewhere. If you go to different places, you will find these different symbols, and that's what a religion is. It revolves around some deity. Well, a cult sort of revolves around a person. Uh, a religion revolves around a deity of some sort who seemingly has the key to heaven or to eternity, not even heaven. And then a denomination revolves around specific beliefs within a particular religious order. Okay, so like in the Christian faith, there are denominations of Methodist and Presbyterian and Baptist and Southern Baptist and Free Will Baptist and Assembly of God and Community Church. And there's all these different denominations under the religious order of Christianity. And so that's sort of what we're talking about today. Usually what happens, and I have this down here, in fact, if you, if you think about it, if you remember back, I just recently watched a documentary on it, but if you remember back, David Koresh, uh, out in Waco, Texas, if you remember back, he read the Bible. He spent all day teaching the people the Bible. He didn't have some book that he had made up. He didn't have some wacko thing that he had just... He, he was teaching them the Bible. And then he got to the point of proclaiming himself to be this deity. He got to the point of twisting the Scripture so that it would satisfy his needs, so it would free him up to do the things he wanted to do. And I, and I wrote down here, usually what happens is that someone takes the Holy Scriptures and then they do what happened in Judges 21, where they do what is right in their own eyes. And I have down here David Koresh with the Branch Davidians, Jim Jones with the People's Temple, Charles Manson with the Manson family, Joseph Smith with the Mormons, L. Ron Hubbard with Scientology. So whether it's a cult, a religion, or denomination, the question isn't can we all just get along? The answer really is are we all equal? Are we all the same? Will, we all, will any of them get us to heaven? So that's what's trending. And it's in our world. And it's, it's very vibrant in our world. And it's very vibrant in our country. Our country is becoming a country of world religions. And some of you, I know Cody's down here from UGA. I imagine at the college campus it's even bigger and it's even uh, more prominent than, than in our local towns. So will they all just get us to heaven? That's the question. Are they all equal? That's the question. That's what's trending today. So now I want to do what I told you I was going to do. I want to examine the truth. I want to examine the truth from the truth. Romans chapter 1. Let me just begin to read some of this scripture and you follow along. Just by the way, this would be a great week to utilize that version Live app because the Scriptures are already in there for you and you don't have to flip or find anything. This would be a great week to utilize that. Romans chapter 1. God promised this good news long ago through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about His Son. In, this, in his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the Son of God when he, was raised, when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey Him, bringing glory to His name. Hop down a few verses to verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God, or even give Him thanks. And get this, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. 
So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. They traded the truth about God for a lie. Romans chapter 3. So, but now God has shown us, this is verse 21, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writing of Moses and the prophets long ago. Verse 22 says, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Verse 23, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus, who freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when He held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For He was looking ahead and including them in what, would, in, in what He would do in this present time. God did this to de- demonstrate His righteousness. For He Himself is fair and just. And He declares sinners to be right in His sight when they believe in Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer is the only way for any of us ever to have a chance or an opportunity to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You can't be good enough. You can't give enough. You can't go enough. You can't tell enough. There's nothing you can do apart from Jesus Christ. To be forgiven of your sins and have eternity in heaven. And so are all religions equal? The answer is no. Will all religions eventually get you to heaven? The answer is no. And folks, I know that many times, and it's not necessarily politically correct to correct someone who believes that it is. And I'm not, and I'll be honest with you, the biggest problem that we have had in the Christian faith isn't what the truth is, but in how we have handled the truth. I'm not setting up picket lines outside the Chinese restaurant. Alright, I'm not calling you to boycott Manny Petties. I'm not calling you to go to the synagogue and to preach to the people that the Messiah has come. I'm not asking you to do that. But what I'm asking you for and what I think God is calling us to, and I believe what has changed in our world today, is that believers cowered away from the truth. We're too scared when somebody else brings it up to even answer them with the truth that it's through Jesus Christ and Him alone. John 14.6 makes it about as clear as anybody could have ever made it. From the mouth of Jesus Himself, here is what He said, I am the way, the truth, And the life. Get this. No one can come to the Father except through me. You may have a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor. They may be a great person. But they may have their faith in something besides Jesus 
Christ. And I'm not calling you to go out and put signs in their yard, Jesus is the way, and all this, but what I'm saying is, don't cower away from the truth. I believe that is what has happened. Sin hasn't changed, God hasn't changed, the sinner hasn't changed, but the believer has become a coward. We've become too scared to tell somebody the truth from the truth. And I believe that's why we see in our world today the good percentage is sliding and the bad percentage is rising. I believe it falls on us. So can we coexist? Yes, we have to live in the same space. We have, we have to shop at the same stores. We have to... But can we coexist? No. All religions are not created equal. No. All religions will not get you to heaven. No. 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 Now, here's... In fact, I wrote this down because I'm going to be pretty pointed with this, but... Here's how I can tell that Christians or believers have changed over the years. When you look at someone who you know believes in a cult or some religious uh, belief other than Jesus Christ, maybe Buddhism, Buddhism, Islam, Mormonism, whatever it is, or maybe not even a believer at all, is this your thought? They're headed to hell. They're headed to hell. They're on the road to hell with that belief. You see, a lot of times we're just like, yeah. I mean, I mean if, if they walked into our church and sat down beside of us, we might would feel at liberty then to give the truth. But a lot of times we'll just pat their backs and shake their heads and yeah, you just, you just go do your thing. We don't think to ourselves, unless something happens in their life that brings them to Jesus Christ, they are headed to hell. And I believe that's one of the things that has changed in our world today. It's not even in our mind when we see those people. It's not one of our first thoughts when we see those people. Certainly sin has not changed. God has not changed. The sinner certainly hasn't changed. But I believe the believer has changed over the years. So here's the important question of the day. What is our response to the truth? What is our response to the truth? Here's the first thing I want to encourage you to do. See what God sees. See what God sees. Every single person, the Bible tells us, has been created in the image of God and is loved by God and has been provided a sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. See what God sees. See those people while they're working on your hands. See those people while they're working up your dinner. See those people that, that may believe in some religion or some cult or, or no religion at all. But see them how God sees them. Not just, hey, you're a good buddy. Hey, yeah, it's all cool. Yeah, let's just go chill. Yeah, it's all really good. Yeah, you can just do whatever you want to and we'll all get to heaven someday. See what God sees. See what God sees. And here's the second thing I want to encourage you to do is to pray for them. Pray for them. They may not be interested in hearing what you have to say. They may not be open for you to share the truth. But you know one thing? They can't stop your prayers. And so when you see what God sees with that employee, when you see what God sees with your neighbor, when you see what God sees with those people sitting in your math class, in your science class, and your gym class, when, when you see what God sees, you can pray for them and nobody can stop that. And then the third thing I want to encourage you to do is to start today. Start today. Who specifically can you pray for today? It could be a family member. It might be a co-worker. It might be another student at your school. 
It, it might be your neighbor to, that lives on your right or your left. It might be someone you just encountered as you uh, uh, went to get a manicure this week. Or it may be someone you encountered uh, as you were out uh, at Walmart this week. Uh, who can you begin to pray for today? Today. Not tomorrow. Today. Because when you see what God sees, and you know the truth of Jesus Christ, you'll begin to pray for those people. In fact, we're going to do something I have never done, I believe, at the Vine. Today, before the band comes, I'm calling you... If there is someone that you need to pray for, I'm going to call you to come forward and pray. I hardly ever do that. I always leave it open and it's all willy-nilly and, and if it feels good, do it. If you want to come, come. But I'm just here to tell you today that we have the ones who have changed. We are the ones whose statistics are sliding. We are the ones that somehow are putting off the message that God isn't as real as He's been in generations past. And so I'm calling you if there's someone that you know of, specifically. I'm just going to call you to come forward and just stand up here and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And then you can pray and the band will play and, and, and we'll go on about our day. So here's what I want you to do. Let's just all stand up. And if there's someone you know specifically that you can pray for, who doesn't know Christ, may even be into some other religion or cult or something else that is driving them and pulling them, but we know it to be a lie from the truth, I'm going to encourage you to come forward and just, just stand up here and we're going to pray. Come on, right now. I know there's many. Who can we pray for today? Each of you know somebody. You've got a name on your heart. God has brought that name to your attention. God has touched your heart today through His Word, through His truth. You have a name on your heart. Today is not the only day you're going to pray for them. I want to encourage you to pray daily for those people. Daily for those people. That they would come to know the truth from the truth. Let's pray. Father God, we stand here today as a bunch of people, Lord, and by Your grace and Your mercy, You have reached down and touched our lives. Lord, You have exposed us and shown us and drawn us to the truth. And Lord, each of us stand here today with a name on our heart, Lord, of someone to pray for, someone that we come in contact with, Lord. And, and they may not be open today to, to hear our message of the truth, but Lord, they cannot stop our prayers. So Lord, as we come today as a group, we begin to pray for those people. And, and I pray that these prayers would go on daily, weekly, monthly, Lord, for these people. And Lord, I think it would, be, it would just be an awesome story someday, Lord, when, when we see some of those get drawn into who Jesus is. When we see those people get drawn into the truth. And Lord, to be able to connect them with the truth of Christ, to be able to connect them with the forgiveness that comes through His blood, to be able to connect them with who He is and the sacrifice He has made for our sins and for their sins. And as the Bible says, to see the scales come off their eyes to the truth. So Lord, I pray for dedication on all those who stand here. That, Lord, they would not just pray today and in this moment and in the next couple of moments. But, Lord, they would pray daily. Maybe they write a name on a card. They stick it on a fridge. They put it somewhere where they'll remember to pray each day for that person. And, Lord, we know that when we bring our prayers to You, that, Lord, You hear them. And, Lord, we know Your heart is to draw them. So, Lord, we, we, we just turn the supernatural work over to You. Lord, we just want to be part of what You call us to do. Lord, we thank You for this today. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Thank you guys. You can head back to your seat. Pray for those people. Pray for those people. Matt. Yeah.